Okay, we finished up the book of Genesis, and we're now going into the book of Romans. Romans is the book that answers the why questions. Well, why is my religion not good enough? Why di did you have to have grace? Isn't my lineage good enough? You know, can I be forgiven from the things I've done? What if I don't go in by faith? What happens then? All these why questions are answered in the book of Romans. I love the book of Romans. When I first started in prison and jail ministry, I taught the book of Romans for six years. Every Sunday afternoon for six years, I taught through the book of Romans. And I love it. I, I just, it's just one of my favorite books. My wife kind of gets tired of it because <laughs> I refer to it all the time, but what can you do? Okay, so who wrote the book of Romans? It was Paul. And in, in the first uh, few verses, Paul says he's a bondservant of Jesus Christ. So what is a bondservant? A bondservant is a willing slave. You see, uh, a person, when they decide they love their master, in Israel, slavery was based upon a, basically a six-year or seven-year term. If you got into debt and you got into trouble, you went to this guy that could pay your debt and you sold yourself into his indentured servitude for a period of time, which is about seven years, and then you served out for seven years with this individual. If by chance during that period of time that you decided you liked your master and he was good to you and you liked serving him and you just loved the, this person that you were working for, you could say that you wanted to be a bond servant. And it had to be a public thing where he would take you to the doorpost of the tabernacle. You would profess that you want to be his servant for life. They would place your ear against the tabernacle doorpost and he would drive an awl through your ear and then they put a gold earring in your ear and that would symbolize that you were a willing slave of this guy for life. That's it. That's how that worked. And that's what Paul is telling us, that he's a willing servant of Jesus Christ. But think about this. Paul was knocked off of his horse on the way to Damascus and God revealed himself and to, to Paul and Paul had a change of heart because Paul was headed to Damascus to persecute the Christians. And, uh, but I think that once he come around and he understood the gospel of Jesus Christ, things not only did he repent of it and do what God was asking, he had a total change of heart. Where did Paul write the book of Romans? He, Paul wrote the book of Romans in Corinth, one of the most corrupt cities ever. You know, in this nation, we used to say, well, you know, they were in Vegas. If you wanted to sin, you went to Sin City, and the Sin City was Vegas. That's kind of lost its thing now because the sins that were propagated in Vegas are everywhere now in this nation. It's just the truth of it. Okay? But Corinth was one of the most corrupt, uh, well, pornographic cities in the ancient world. The best word is pornographic. It was just pure wickedness on a scale that you can't even imagine. And when he wrote this was between 53 and 59 AD, during the rule of Nero. And I've heard different commentaries go back and forth on the exact timing, but it was in the 50s, okay, is when he wrote it, and he wrote it during the rule of Nero. Now, when you read through the book of Romans, you need to take that into context to the people that he's writing it to. These people are seeing some of the hardest persecution that Christians saw. Nero would get Christians and he'd put them on poles and he'd cover them with grease and light them on fire to illuminate his gardens at night. That's the type of guy we're talking about. Okay? So <laughs> when he's in uh, the first chapter, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's a bold statement during that time frame that he would not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because Proposing the gospel of Jesus Christ could cost you your life, and in a very painful way. Now, in uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 13, he tells us the exact why he wrote the book of Romans. 
And it states, Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you, you also, just as among other Gentiles. It was Paul's desire to see the gospel of Jesus Christ to go out, that people would grow in the faith, that people would become established as Christians, that there wouldn't be a half-hearted Christianity or some religiosity being practiced. It would be true faith in Jesus Christ. Now, there, the other part of this whole thing is how Paul broke the book of Romans down. A lot of people don't think about it this way, but it's broke down in these three things, faith, hope, and love. Faith chapters are from chapters 1 through 8. Hope chapters are verses 9 through 12, I mean chapters 9 through 12. And the love chapters are 13 through 16. Now, faith talks about how our faith is established in Jesus Christ in the first eight chapters of Romans. Wonderful, wonderful work on this. And the hope chapter deals with the fact that God's not done with the nation of Israel. There's more to come yet. Amen. And the fact of the matter is, most of this replacement theology that is rampant in the church today is actually antithetical to these three chapters. Antithetical to God's plan. And also, if you have a conservative hermeneutic, a conservative interpretation of the scripture, and you believe in a pre-trib rapture, Romans 9, 10, and 11, and parts of 12, support the, that type of biblical interpretation. And the love chapters, 13 through 16. Those how deal with how do you live as a Christian? The how-tos. Well, if I do this, how do I do that? That's simply what it is. But here's the other thing, too. The book of Romans is such a dynamic book, such a literary masterpiece, that the law schools in this nation often have a course on teaching the book of Romans for argumentation, to teach people how to argue their point. Because, look, let's face it, Paul was a genius. Paul not only knew the secular world and its teachings, but Paul also studied under Gamaliel in Jerusalem, which was the highest, the pinnacle of the rabbis for the Jews at the time. He was it. If you wanted a good education, like an Ivy League education, Paul had it. And it's really interesting that he is held in contrast to the disciples, the, f the first apostles, because most of those guys were just regular guys, you know? And it is a, isn't it strange that these regular guys are the ones that are sent to the Jewish people, and Paul, this guy that possesses all this knowledge and all this skill at argumentation, is sent to the Gentiles. I think he needed to be like that so that he could translate the concepts of a monotheistic religion to these pagan people. You know, in the first centuries, the first century, they used to call Christians atheists because they believed in only one God. We're also going to look at the fact that in the book of Romans, how principle frames good emotion bracketing, bracketed by hope. I'm going to tell you something about my mistake in ministry years ago. I made a mistake in ministry years ago in order to appeal to the, I was used to preaching to inmates and men. And so I softened my message for the ladies. Okay. That is antithetical to what you're supposed to do. We're supposed to feed the sheep. And why do I bring that up? Because I was playing to emotions. And we, we must not ever play to emotions when we're studying the scriptures. We need to listen to the principles that are being transmitted to us. You know, we might not like to eat Brussels sprouts, but Brussels sprouts at times are good for us. <laughs> the principles of our faith allow us to understand what the good course of action is when our emotions are telling us to go the exact opposite direction. 
In other words, when you're confused by situations and in, in certain sequences of your life, if you grasp a hold of what God says is true and you hang on tight, even though it's completely against what you're feeling, that will lead you home safely. Your emotions will always shipwreck you. The Word of God says, the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? Now, how many times have we heard in movies and television and radio and books and novels and magazines, follow your heart? They're telling you to follow something that's deceitfully wicked. I'm telling you to follow God and his word and his principles laid out for life. The Jews have a saying, saying they say, Lachayim. It means to life. And that's what the book of Romans is. It's to life. It's to give you life, to show you these truths, to explain them in a way that makes sense, to tie everything together. Hope gives us reason to act on a principle, this hope in God's word. Love is not emotion, it is an action. Think about that. Every time you read about love in the Bible, it's somebody acting lovingly towards somebody else. It's not a feeling of love. It's an acting of love. Okay? Some young teenager comes up to you and says, oh, I'm just in love with her. You have to say, young man, you're in lust with her, is what you are. Now, I don't mean to be crass, but we need to be real. The reason why this country is the way it is is because people have been too afraid to say the truth about these things, been too afraid that they might uh, hurt somebody's feelings. And I made that mistake, that's what I was talking about, where I made a mistake one time where I softened my message at this la the last church I pastored. And I shouldn't have softened my message. I should have just told the absolute truth. I shouldn't have skimmed over anything and I should have dealt with it. But I'm not going to do that with you. And it's not because I'm trying to be harsh or unloving to anybody. I'm really trying to be loving because let me tell you, not a person in here, if they saw a two-year-old running across the living room floor with a knife in his hand, wouldn't snatch that child up and take that knife out of his hand, even if it was very abrupt. Right? So that's where we're headed with this. So Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Are you guys ready? Let's go. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets and holy scriptures concerning this, his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's, to me, it's almost like poetry to le read what Paul writes. Just his way of writing. My brother here talks about his run-on sentences. I love his run-on sentences. But yes, Paul is the, is the king of the run-on sentence. In the first verse, Paul refers to himself as a bondservant. And we went over that about the bondservant. If you want to know the reference in the Old Testament to that, that's Exodus chapter 21, verses 5 through 7. It also refers to, it's referred to in the New Testament 127 times about these bond servants. Paul, Paul's gospel, the, pro, the promise of, promised by God through the prophets, flesh is the seed of David, the Holy Spirit, the power of the resurrection, the testimony in his office. These are what's being covered in these first few verses. And who is it being written to? It's being written to believers in Rome. And in his greeting, he says, grace and peace. See, the Greek greeting was grace. And the Jewish greeting was peace. And we hear this oftentimes today. We hear the Jews saying, shalom, shalom. That means peace. 
and it was include, to include all people in Rome. Now, where did these Romans come from? Where did these Roman believers come from? We see in Acts chapter 2, it's talking about Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost, excuse me, not Pentecost Sunday, Pentecost. And at Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples, and they burst out of that room, and Peter preached that sermon. And all these people spoke to other people in, in uh, tongues, speaking their, to them in their own native languages about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And 3,000 were added to the church that day. Now, I'm sure these people believed, and they had a good heart, and they had the Holy Spirit, and they were being taught by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit was bringing to remembrance, but they needed a physical, a flesh and blood teacher to come and teach them, and that's what Paul wanted to do. He wanted to get to Rome to talk to these people who had come to Christ at these first beginnings of the church. Now, can you imagine being a small family of people, being in Jerusalem for the Passover that, that, uh, that year, and being there long enough to be there for Pentecost, and all of a sudden you hear this gospel of Jesus Christ being poured out, and these guys speaking in all these different languages, but all these guys are Galilean? It'd be like me speaking Chinese, you know, fluently. They understood what these people were saying. Because they even said, are these not Galileans? You know? And so the gospel of Jesus Christ went out, and these people went back to their homes, and they began to spread the word of God. But they needed a shepherd. And that's what these apostles did, is they went out into these communities and they shepherded these flocks, and they built them up, and they taught them doctrine, and they taught them the Word of God. And they taught them the teachings of Christ. You see, the Gospel is one thing. That, it, that allows you to become justified in Jesus Christ. When we become justified, we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior into our hearts. And He cleanses us from all our sins. And that's wonderful. And that's our birthday. But sanctification is something totally different. Sanctification is when the Lord's growing you up in Him. That takes a little mentorship. That takes some scriptural knowledge. That takes some time and prayer and spending time alone with Christ. Because we don't, even today, with the re revelation of God's Word to us that we have, even today we struggle with why does this happen to God's people? We don't know the answers to all these questions. But we do know who, who allows it into our life, who lets it filter through his fingers into our life to grow us up, to sanctify us into Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. This book is not to unbelievers. This book is to believers. But yet you can take the book of Romans and you can lead somebody to Christ through the Romans road, which is Romans 3.23 all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, For the punishment of sin is death, but the gift is God of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then you go over to Ephesians 2.8 and, and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, not of work, lest anyone should boast it is a free gift of God. Then you go back to Romans 10.9. If you believe in your heart that God raise them from the dead and profess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. That's the Roman road. And that's for unbelievers and believers alike. It's for unbelievers to bring them to Christ. It's for believers to remember who they are in Christ. How many times have we as believers struggled with our faith? Am I truly saved? I don't feel saved. Am I saved? I keep doing the same bad thing over and over again. Why is this? Paul is going to answer some of those questions. Paul will show you the answers to these questions. Listen in these next few chapters. We have some great teachers here. And I love to hear their different perspectives on the, these things. Let's get back to Romans. Romans chapter 1, verse 8. For our, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, see he's a southerner, you all, <laughs> that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, 
that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by some means now at last I find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both you and me. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and unwise, so as much as is in me, I am already ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. So if you think you're frustrated when you've made plans, I'm going to go do this, and I want this to be how it's established, and I want to do that over here. Look right here, Paul's saying the very same thing. Hey guys, I wanted to come to you, but I kept on getting hindered. I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't get there. You're in good company. Best laid plans of mice and men, I guess. Oh, man. When by means, when, when and by what means did it come to Rome? And that's what we talked about in Acts chapter 2. Specifically, Acts chapter 2, verse 10, speaks of those who are in Rome who heard the gospel preached at Pentecost. <laughs> If then the first believers from Rome witnessed the miracle and the filling of the Holy Spirit, Paul, in verses 9 through 12, refers to it as a starting point. By the witness of God, Paul, Paul's spirit slash service to prayer for them. Think about this. Wouldn't it be awesome if you heard that one of the apostles was praying for you and your church? Would that bolster you up? You're under this great persecution. You don't think anybody cares about you. Life is becoming extremely difficult. You worry about your wife and your children or your husband and your children. Because the Roman guard could knock down your door at any time, break into your house, take you away, and that would be it. And you would have no idea what happened to them. But you know that you're facing certain death. You're facing martyrdom. But all you'd have to do is forsake your, your God. You'd ha all you'd have to do is forsake Christ. And you wouldn't have to worry about it. Sometimes these, they burn people or they kill people, martyred them, for simply not putting a pinch of incense on the altar of the emperor. Just that simple. Renounce Christ. No. Christ is Lord. See, that was treason in the Roman Empire. They were literally committing treason, saying that Christ was Lord. Because in the Roman Empire, Caesar was Lord. So this is where they were drawing the line on things. And in any moment, these people could break in and take your family from you. And yet you knew that the Apostle Paul was praying for you. And he cared for you as much that he had been trying to get to you, but things kept getting in his way. And also, Paul was not afraid of extending his hands out and working with the Greeks, and he says to the barbarians, he, that he, he had debts to these barbarians as well as the Greeks who helped support him in his ministry, both to wise and unwise. There's, you know, we have wise and unwise people with us today. But don't take that to heart because we get on further in this chapter. We're going to see what God has to say about that. Let's move on. Romans verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. For everyone who believes, for the Jew first, also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is received from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. This verse is what sparked the Reformation. 
This is what excited Martin Luther. Martin Luther had gone through years of self-flagellation, of denial, of fasting, of going to different monasteries, of studying, and he come across this, and it lit up in his mind, in his soul, that just shall live by faith. And thus began the Reformation. And they began to study soteriology, the doctrines of salvation. And he began to understand that faith was from the beginning, just like in Hebrews chapter 11. Read Hebrews chapter 11 on your own time, the great hall of faith. It was by faith from the beginning, as it is faith today, as it will be faith during the tribulation, as it will be faith after the tribulation. It is by faith. The just shall live by faith. But many people don't know that he was quoting from Habakkuk 2.4. And in Habakkuk 2.4 it reads, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Paul was quoting Habakkuk, an Old Testament prophet. So these are not New Testament ideas, this is an Old Testament principle. That it's by faith that we enter in. And I told you about in Hebrews chapter 11, the rallying cry of Luther and the Reformers. This is what spawned all this stuff having to do with Protestant churches. But I like to think that the, God had a remnant within his churches down through history, just as he had a remnant in Israel during Elijah's day. He has a, had a, he's had a remnant within the churches all the way down until present day. Amen. Just the doctrine of salvation had been muddied up. And the Bible went out into the world again. And Luther, when they asked him when he was translating the Bible into German, they said, what's going to happen if the common people can read the Bible? And he says, perhaps we'll have more Christians. And I think we need to remember that. Romans verse 18. We're getting ready to head into this section here that's talking about things. And many times people will use this last half of Romans to bludgeon people about their sexual moorings. To point out that God is not happy with it. But I'm going to tell you about something, a different perspective about it, and it's not her heretical. This is not only about personal morality. This has very much to do with national morality. And acceptance of things out of feelings instead of out of principle. We must but live by the principles of God, not by our feelings. Our feelings is what's got us into the mess we are in today, in this nation and in this world. I feel like I can do what I want. Folks, there's a verse that says, there's a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is death. Verse 18. For the wrath of God is real, revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the image like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore God has also given them over to, up to uncleanness in their lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what was against nature. Likewise also men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one for another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of the error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting 
being fi filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgments of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Now, I read that in one large chunk because it, I really think you need to hear that in one, one large chunk. Now, let's break this down. Verses 18 through 21 gives the answer to those who say, what about those who have never heard the gospel? And the answer is in those verses. The answer is, if no one has has talked to them about the gospel, God has. God has given them his testimony in creation and in their hearts. It is still a matter of faith. So if nobody's reached the unreached people, God has still spoken to them in their hearts. How many times have we heard stories of missionaries where they're talking to a, some tribe that has never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and they respond back, oh, we know this guy. We, we know this person whom you're speaking. We just didn't know his name. That's happened time and time again. But God also says that he speaks to them clearly. We see creation and if you have a little intellectual honesty. You have to say, somebody had to create all this. This is not by chance. This can't be by chance. You see, in science, there's the law of causality. There has to be a cause. And so oftentimes, atheistic scientists lean on the laws of causality to fit their experiments. But when it comes to the fact of where did it all come from, they go back to, well, it came from nothing. God says that's craziness. There is a cause, and there is, and God is the causality of everything. Verse 18, they suppress the truth. Suppression of truth is a sin. It is a lie of omission. Make no mistake. Don't second guess that. When you hear somebody say, well, I'm just protecting. Well, you know something, sometimes we need to hear the truth. But the truth needs to be spoken of in love. Sometimes we need to hear the truth about ourselves. And sometimes that's the hardest thing to hear. But we need to hear it and we need to receive it. And then we need to adjust whatever it is accordingly. Verse 19, God has shown it to them. God's shown himself to them through nature, through speaking into their hearts. From the beginning until not now, God has been showing them. So there is no excuse. So when our hearts go out to these people and we, we feel guilty, because I hear this from people at times, often people that are reluctant to come to Christ. Well, I'm not going to come to Christ because Christ hasn't been preached to everybody. And it's a, just a, a crazy, crazy statement. You're not going to come because they haven't heard? Well, hear the gospel and go tell them. Yeah. Right? Simple. But that's why people, they run, they try and find some kind of excuse not to do that. Let me tell you, if somebody says they're not ready to accept Jesus Christ, it's because they don't want to give up their sin. They're afraid that if they accept Jesus Christ, their lifestyle is going to have to change. They don't know that God will help them with the change. And here's another thing. You don't have to clean up to come to Jesus Christ. Come to Jesus Christ and he'll wash you up from the inside out and then you will truly be clean. Amen. How many times have we talked to people and they feel convicted about coming to church because they're doing all the stuff they're doing and they misunderstand it. We're like little children to him. Does a little child tell his mother, whoa, 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 don't touch my diaper. Let me go clean it up and then we can talk, you know. That's not it. But to us, we're running around in a bunch of dirty diapers and telling God, whoa, 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 I'll take care of that. 
And there's no way possible we can take care of that. God will take care of that. He will wash us from the inside out. He'll come into our hearts. God can change men where just morality can't. Because God can change us from the inside. Where morality only changes the appearance of the outside. But how long does that last? Proverbs 9.10 talks about the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. You know, we read on down in verse 22 and 23, the natural progression of things is unbelief. And the delusion of knowledge, the delusion of wisdom, man, mankind wisdom, manly wisdom, it is a delusion. It's a falsehood. We, ha we are filled and saturated in this society with manly, humanistic wisdom. And what is it getting us? It's getting us corruption at the deepest level. We look back to our fathers and, and our grandfathers and we say, oh, it was so good back in 1940s. Guys, they had to face Hitler. They had to face the wor World War II. They had all this stuff going on. They had their problems too. But the one thing they didn't have, they had that we don't have, is society in general had a moral compass. They had and they knew the word of God where we don't. You see, we're to study to show ourselves an approved workman, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're to study the word of God. It's our responsibility. And then that's why Proverbs 9, 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We've lost the fear of God in this country. Fear of God. Now that has some people upset. But to me, fear of God talks about the reverence for a father. And it should for you. I remember as a little kid going into church. And I went to this Presbyterian church in Weezer. And I can remember walking in there and this awe that I was in God's house. We have lost this awe of approaching God. Yes, we can come into, our, into the throne room of heaven boldly. We can boldly approach the throne when we've been bought and paid for by the blood of Christ. But heaven help us if we haven't truly placed our faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. Because then we are not children. And the only way we need to prove that the wise... Declaring them, thinking themselves to be wives, they have become fools. Just watch the nightly news and the examples of all the, all the experts they parade across the TV and the wokeness and this and that. Look at the people that get fired from these corporations for standing up for morality. Just the simplest things. I believe that marriage is between a man and a woman and somebody's going to lose their career over that. The world has gone crazy because Christ is about to return. Verse 22, when we don't worship God, we will worship something. So here we find that the true birth of idolatry as a refusal to worship the creator. The rest is window dressing. They worship creatures. They worship man. They worship birds. They worship creeping things on the ground. Worship in cultures sold out to this most notably would be India, where there is over two million gods that are worshipped now. Each one putting the worshiper deeper and deeper into bondage. But it doesn't stop there. Worship of self is our culture, where the personal accomplishment is the pinnacle of existence. It levels, its levels are determined by possessions. And we believe that who dies with the most toys wins. If that isn't idolatry, I don't know what is. Then the worship of man is communism, with its doctrines of evolutionism, insists that we are the end and un unto ourselves, that we can become gods, masters of the universe. That's communism, socialism, evolutionism. What about the worship of religion? Oh, I like all the rituals. 
I like, I like that stained glass window. I like the robes. I like that. I feel so pious getting up and getting down, getting on my knees, saying this prayer, putting this oil on here, doing this, doing that, doing all these religious activities, burning my incense. Worship of religion is that we can become good enough to warrant the favor of God or that we may transcend to his level. What was the first lie told in the Garden of Eden? It was, you too can become like God, knowing good and evil. But think about that lie. All Satan was really offering Eve was evil. She was living in good and knew nothing else. All he really offered her was evil. And she accepted it. And so did Adam. There is nothing that is different from the beginning until now. You want to spot a cult, you want to spot an ism, you ask, how do, how do you become saved? And if they say anything other than through Jesus Christ and his shed blood on the cross and faith in him, anything else, it's a cult, it's an ism, they're trying to let you work your way to God some other way. These are the things Paul will be talking about in the book of Romans. This is the beginning of this book. This is the most highest form of literature. It is the best treatise on religion and philosophy that we have. Paul was an amazing guy. But he was an amazing guy who was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit spoke through Paul to us through the book of Romans. I invite each and every one of you to come back each week and go through it with us. And soon you'll understand why I love this book so much. And I'm so passionate about people learning it. Verses 24 and 25 declare the judgment. This is what I was talking about. This is what I was talking about where the nation begins to accept homosexuality as norm. It, it becomes accepted. And not only that does it become accepted, you're a pariah if you say it isn't normal. This is a judgment. God turns them over to a debased mind. He turns them over to an insane mind. They have become insane in their lust. The problem with lust is once you get to begin lusting after something and you achieve it, it isn't what you thought. And so you develop another lust about something else and you try and achieve that and that doesn't solve it. And on and on and on until your lust finally kills you in some form. Our country is under judgment because we've accepted homosexual lifestyles as normal. Our country is under judgment because we don't know what a man and a woman is and we appointed a Supreme Court justice who couldn't define what a man or a woman was. Guys, thinking they are wise, they have become fools and exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. <sighs> I get a little uh, passionate about this because no other country on the face of the earth has ever survived when they've headed down this road. None of them. And we're headed full steam down these tracks towards the edge of the cliff. So this is what I'm talking about. Christ told us in John chapter 15, verse 12, this one command I give you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. This is where we need to lovingly speak the truth into the lives of the people around us. And sometimes that is the most difficult, painful, emotional thing that will ever happen. But pray that God would give you the words to speak the truth to those people around you. Just pray for it. 
and it has affected people in our church. It has affected people in our communities, our neighbors, our families. We simply as a society need to unplug for about six months, step back and take a breath because we are being brainwashed. And when you see Christians beginning to agree with what's going on, it's really concerning. <clears throat> that takes us down to verse 26. Even their women begin to take part. So often women in cultures have been the holdback of corruption because they had the most to lose in corruption. So how do you overcome this? Think of, think of this as a strategy of the enemy. How do you overcome the morality of women in society so you can totally corrupt it? Well, that's pretty easy. One, you pit the wives against the husbands and you say they're just holding them down. Two, you establish a welfare state. Three, you give them, you give them a status in their working environment. Three, three, they give them child care. Four, they give them free housing. Five, they give affirmed independence. And six, the community family instead of the family, the husband and the wife. In other words, it takes a village to raise a child. This is how you corrupt a nation. Yes, the men have responsibility, but at this point in time, they're attacking the ladies. And men, you ought to stand up as men of God and defend the ladies and say, you, I love you, honey. I want to be your provider and your protector. These are discussions my wife and I had because we were both train wrecks when we met each other. We both tried everything and were total disasters. And we said, well, we gotta give, we gotta give God a try and we gotta give him a try 100%. And thank God my wife is an all-in type of lady because I'm an all-in type of guy. And we tried it and our lives turned around. And I would encourage each one of you to be an all-in Christian. Each and every one of you. There's things I don't want to do. But there's things that I must do as a man of God. But here's the other thing about this. Anytime God's talking to men, he takes about six verses to tell them that, what he wants them to do. Anytime he's talking to ladies, he says, ladies, submit to your husband. And then he goes to the goes to the husband. Husbands, love your wife, just like Christ loved the church. Now, how did Christ love the church? He died for the church. Men, you're called to die. Let's get that straight. You're called to die. Die to self, die to lust, die to pleasure. You're called to die. You're called to provide for your wife. Now, you can live it. You can try all you want. And I know many of us have gone through hard marriages and tough times. Some of us have been divorced. Some of us have come out of divorce. The Bible also says, live at peace as much as it is possible for you. I understand and I have, I want you to know there's forgiveness of sins. There's only one unpardonable sin, one. And that's dying without acknowledging Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because in that, you call the Holy Spirit a liar. That's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's it. So men, the ladies will come along. You just have to be the man of God. You have to be the leader of your house. You have to put down your pornography. You have to put down your vehicles. You have to put down your guns and your hunting. You have to put down everything except God first in your life, then your family, then you. That is the appropriate order. Then we begin to see revival. Then we begin to see a turning around of this nation. Then we begin to see people changed. See, judgment begins at the house of God. It always does. Let's clean up our house and then let's go out and tell others about how great it is to live for Christ. Because I can tell you, because I've lived the other life, this is much better. It's much more fulfilling than living that other garbage. 
waking up and trying to remember where you were. Where am I today? You know? Not only that, it's you can lay your head on your pillow at night and sleep. You don't have to think about, oh boy, what did I tell them? You know, to cover up for my sin. Now you're free. Jesus Christ talks about freedom, doesn't he? You know, there's nothing that is better that I can come home and I don't have to worry about anything about coming home to my wife because she knows everything. Sometimes she knows too much. <laughs> but she does know everything about me. Okay. Guys, then we go on down to verse 26 and 27. You know, think about the curse. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. Women were given a desire to rule over their husbands, and husbands were given the charge to rule over their wives. And his work that he was to enjoy became full of thorns and stickers. Now, think about that. One wants to rule, another one doesn't want to rule. But the one that doesn't want to rule is supposed to be in charge. <laughs> okay? It's a mess. But when we submit to God's perfect plan, life gets a whole lot easier and a whole lot better. Proverbs 14, 12. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. I was trying to walk my life the way I thought was right. I would accept part of God's law, the ones I liked. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. All right? But the parts about self-sacrifice and putting others ahead of myself, I did not like it. And I didn't want to live by it. And I'm going to talk, we're going to cut to the end of this real quick. Not because I'm trying to cut, it, cut this off. But I can wrap this up in an idiom that's used in our culture today. Misery loves company. You see, in the last few verses of chapter 1, it talks about the fact that they approve of those who practice the same, even though they know that it brings them upon the righteous judgment of God. They know they're under the judgment of God. Yet they're going to propose to stay the course and they are approving of these people, trying to affirm this lifestyle. Does that sound familiar? This lifestyle they're trying to affirm in our society today. We are living in Romans chapter 1. So when people say, do you wonder if the, nation, if the United States is under judgment? My answer is yes. The United States is under judgment. And it can get far worse before it's going to get better if we as Christians don't act like Christians. Last week I told you about what Mahatma Gandhi said. He would become a Christian if it weren't for the Christians. <laughs> Now, I hate to say that because that's a scathing indictment of us. Because the first century Christians, they, their enemies spoke about how they loved one another. I would encourage and challenge each one of you to love those who hate you, to pray for those who despitefully use you, to live out these principles Christ has set out for us. <coughs> Don't just let them be platitudes. Live them in your life. Guys, this is our solution. We want to go and solve something through elections and all this. And we elect somebody and we think that this, oh, this person's a Christian, this is going to solve it. And then we find out they're as corrupt as the next guy. <coughs> the only thing that will solve any of this is Jesus Christ. Yeah. And that's it. He is either going to solve it for us through rapture or revival. But don't think this is the only time that our nation has ever been here. Sometime take some time and read some history about the Great Awakening. Read what this nation was like just before the Great Awakening. It was terrible. It was like this time, very close. All right, guys, let's pray.